I am David, your developer on Duty, and in this video we're going to have a look at the future of programming languages. Let's face it, most developers are unhappy with the current programming languages. For low-level systems with high performance requirements, C or C++ are the dominant players, even though they have a lot of foot guns like use after free, making it hard to develop safe programs. I would even argue that for complex systems with many developers, it's impossible to create safe programs written in C. And for high-level systems, the most popular languages are either dynamically typed ones like JavaScript or Python, where it's basically the Wild West. You have a lot of freedom how you design your program, but that comes at a cost. Many errors, which could have easily been caught by stricter compilers, only happen during runtime. And we all know that runtime errors, if not caught during testing, hopefully automatic tests, will cause a lot of trouble because they have the potential to bring down your productive program and fixing them requires a lot of time for you and your user because bug reports have to be written and you need to reproduce them first before you can fix them. So bugs should be detected during compile time if possible. Then you also have statically typed languages like Java with a very strong object-oriented model. Compared to dynamically typed ones, they have better guarantees due to static typing, but it comes at the cost of being overly verbose. In Java, you typically create many weird abstractions to accomplish simple tasks. Nobody fully understands the code after a thousand layers of abstract factory composite singleton controller adapters. And the type system itself is not great and lacks things like algebraic data types. And all those object-oriented languages suffer from one hidden enemy, mutable state. You can encapsulate it in objects, but without tooling support, it's still hard to manage it properly. Every object state can potentially be changed anywhere, and in the end, reasoning about the system becomes almost impossible if it reaches a certain amount of complexity. Then you have pure functional languages, like for example Haskell, with beautiful mathematical designs which actually solve the problem of mutable state. But they require a lot of knowledge from the developers who need to know many novel mechanisms, like for example monads. The problem in Haskell is that it's hard to optimize your code. Simple, idiomatic Haskell is beautiful, but performance-optimized Haskell is not straightforward and might look incomprehensible. There's a great tool at our disposal, LLVM. When creating programming languages, you just need to compile it to a language-independent intermediate representation. LLVM then takes care of optimizing and compiling it, allowing it to run on various platforms. This tool enabled many great languages like Rust, Zig, Crystal and Bail. One of the awesome new languages is Rust. It borrows great proven concepts from other languages like for example algebraic data types. It makes sure that the language constructs don't lead to slow or inefficient code. Rust calls it zero-cost abstractions. I think that Rust really makes no compromise when it comes to performance. It wants to be a serious contender to other systems programming languages, therefore there is no wiggle room to introduce concepts which would create hidden performance penalties. But not only that, there's also no compromise regarding memory safety. This must not be delegated to the programmer, it must be inherent in the language. And last but not least, Rust tries to tackle the problem of mutable state with heavy restrictions where the state can be modified through the borrow checker, the resulting programs are easier to reason about, albeit harder to write. Architecture must not be an afterthought. However, there are also some downsides in Rust. Some functionality, which is easy to achieve in other languages, might be rather hard in Rust, especially if you are dabbling in the async ecosystem. You have to know about concepts like boxing, pinning, you need to know about various smart pointers, how memory is laid out, and if your main task is to solve a business problem, this will totally slow you down and drains your brain capacity. In my opinion, one always needs to carefully think about what type of software one is developing. Is it a one-off tool to solve a quick task which only roughly needs to work without even needing to tackle all possible corner cases? then Rust is probably not the right tool as it's way too pedantic.
But if you're writing a software component, which is long lived, involves many other developers, and is shipped to production where runtime errors have big consequences, then Rust might actually be a huge improvement. Unfortunately, there's not any mainstream programming language which tackles both extremes, easy to write and easy to make write. Currently, it's one or the other. But Rust is not the end of the endeavor to create the perfect language. It might just be a stepping stone to something even greater. And there are a lot of new programming languages in development. And by all means, that doesn't mean that Rust will be replaced. Those various new attempts might just explore new ideas, which then could even be incorporated into Rust. So I don't see them as contenders. Instead, I see them as frontrunners for better ideas. In the end, the hardest part of a new programming language is to gain enough traction to become mainstream. And let's be honest, there's only a very small chance for that happening. Usually, only if you solve multiple problems at once without introducing too many downsides. Even Rust struggles with mainstream adoption despite its success on many levels. So let's have a look at some of the lesser known languages. NIM is one of those languages I wished would have become mainstream. It's remarkable that one can write highly efficient code in such a simple way. The code is easy to read and really a pleasure to look at. It's compiled to C, but can also be compiled to JavaScript. So here's some example code of NIM and just see how elegant it is. No unnecessary syntax, everything's clean. In this case, we import some library from standard we create our own type called person, which is an object, which has two properties, name as a string and age as a natural number. We can create an array of people with uh, persons in it. And then we can iterate over these people and we have type safe string interpolation, which is evaluated at compile time. So since NIM compiles to C, you can generate native dependency free executables and you're not dependent on a virtual machine and those executables you generate, they are small and therefore allow for easy redistribution. The compiler can generate executables for all major platforms, for example, Windows, Linux, BSD, and Mac OS. And NIMS memory management is deterministic and customizable, and it even follows some move semantics, which are inspired by C++ and Rust. And it's therefore also suited for embedded and hard real-time systems. You can even choose which garbage collector runs. As said before, NIM allows for extremely performant code. It has concepts, for example, like uh, zero overhead iterators. And one of the things I like very much is compile time evaluation. So parts of your code can actually run during compile time and not during runtime. It also supports uh, various backends. So you can compile it to C or even C++ or JavaScript. So NIM can even run in the browser, if you will. NIM is also very expressive. For example, NIM is self-contained. That means the compiler and the standard library, they are both implemented in NIM and it turtles all the way down. If you want to see how something of the standard library is implemented, you just have to read some NIM code, which is great. NIM also has a powerful macro system and you can actually directly manipulate the abstract syntax tree and therefore you can create your own domain specific languages, for example. It's also very elegant, for example, macros, they cannot change NIM syntax, and usually there's also no need for it. Um, it has a modern type system and also local type inference. That means you don't have to clutter all your code with type hints. Usually it can be inferred. You have tuples, you have generics, you have some types, everything you need. And statements are grouped by indentation and they can span multiple lines. So you don't need curly braces or something and your code looks pretty clean. So to give you an example how elegant NIM sometimes can be, um, there's a thing called method called syntax. And this is one of the advantages of object-oriented programming usually, or they say that you can group your functionality to the objects and in NIM that's not even needed. So for example, if you have this free flowing function called method name, which takes an object as the first parameter and also some other arguments, then you can always write it as object dot method name with the remaining arguments. And this is really great because then you can group functionality based on the first parameter of the function, so to say.
So as an example, let's say you have this free, uh, defined this function called right line, which takes standard out as a first parameter and hello as a string. Then you can write the same thing as standard out dot right line and provide the remaining argument. In this case, it's hello. So another thing in NIM which I find quite nice is how you call procedures or functions. So let's just say you have here this procedure called call me and it takes an X and a Y of type int and S of type string and a few other um, arguments. Then there are different ways to actually call this uh, procedure. So you can call it uh, in a, let's say, usual way where you provide the arguments uh, in a comma separated way. So that's something which you would have in most programming languages. But it's also possible to call the same procedure with named arguments. And that allows you also to change the order of those arguments. So for example, you say y equals to one, x equals to zero, and also the other parameters. And here x and y are even changed in the order, but it's clear which parameter is set. And especially if you have Boolean parameters, which can be true or false, it's never really clear if you, let's say, call a function and provide the value true what that Boolean parameter does without also providing the name of the parameter. So this is quite elegant. I especially like the macro system in NIM and as a fun exercise, I created my own domain specific language called Nary and it allows you to create SQL statements using plain NIM code, so to say. So in this case, I create a result object uh, where I invoke my Nary macro and I just write my pseudo SQL statement, so to say. I just write select my DB table, can provide a list of columns, can provide a where clause where I compare various columns and I can also use function calls in there and so on. And then if I take this result object and perform two SQL on it, then I get the resulting SQL string, which is quite cool. So here's another language I wanna show you. It's called the Veil programming language and it's a brand new language currently still in its alpha version, but I really like the concepts and the technical write-ups of its main developer are fantastic. So here's some example hello world program. It's relatively straightforward. You have here your function main and you just print hello world. And you can also have, for example, an array of planets. And then you can have a for each loop over those planets and print something. So Veil is fast. It uses LLVM as a compiler backend. It's statically typed and it uses so-called generational references. I come to that in a second. It's a technique for memory safety. And soon it will have a region borrow checker to make it even faster. And because it uses generational references, it's also safe. And it also has fearless foreign function interface. And of course, Veil strives to be easy and memory safe. So let's have a look at this interesting concept of generational references. And it's also a prime example of the great technical write-ups of the technical lead, Evan Ovadia. So generational references they are a memory management technique which allows for easy, deterministic and very fast memory access. So generational references are built on the concept of single ownership that you might already know from Rust, for example. So every object in Veil has one and only one owning reference. And if that owning reference goes out of scope, the object can be freed. And in addition to owning references, you can also have non-owning references, as many as you want. So the references in Veil are so-called generational references, where you not only store the pointer to the object, but also the current generation of the target. So if somebody would then later on free that object for which you have this generational reference, you can compare the saved generation, which you remembered before, with the target generation. And if there's a mismatch, you know that the object you're pointing to was already freed. The author also looked at the performance overhead of generational references. And for this, he compared it to the baseline, which is unsafe. That means just follow the pointer and don't do anything else, which has no memory safety whatsoever. And he found out that generational references have roughly 10.8% uh, 
performance overhead compared to unsafe. And um, he also compared reference counting to unsafe and reference counting has roughly 25% performance overhead. Now let's look at the difference between normal reference counting and generational references. Let's take a look at a simple example how reference counting works. Let's just say we have a function launch ship, which has ships, which is a map which maps integers to references of spaceships. You get an ID of type int and an armada, which is a list of references to spaceships. Now, if you perform this operation here, ships get ID, you get a reference to your spaceship. That means you have to increment the ship's counter. And once the ship goes out of scope, you have to decrement the ship's counter and additionally check if the counter is zero. And if it's zero, you have to deallocate the ship. So now when you have generational references, it works a bit differently. So if you perform this operation, ship equals to ships.getID, then you don't change the target memory, right? You don't have to increase any counter there. The generation just stays the same. Only if you dereference the object, for example, you look at the property name, then you have to make sure that the generation matches. So the generation of the reference you mem memorized must be the same with the actual generation of the object. So usually programs dereference less than they alias and dealience. So this operation is usually less frequent than just aliasing and therefore generational references are cheaper performance-wise. Generational references are also more cache-friendly and they have better branch prediction. So this was just one example of the great things happening. The world of programming languages is fantastic. Even though at our day jobs we're kind of stuck with the mainstream languages, the future looks bright. So many interesting concepts, so many new and better ways of doing things makes me curious and I can't wait to see the future impact of such languages. I hope I could spark your interest and that you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what your favorite language is and what features you like most. Thanks for watching and stay tuned.